Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our panel session uh, looking at the security of autonomous driving networks. Uh, very pleased to introduce our panelists. Uh, we've got Peter Davis uh, from Talis UK, uh, Sandra Scott Hayward from Queen's University Belfast, Gerald Delemos from the University of Kent here, and Jing Jia Zhang from Huawei uh, in Paris and online. Uh, we have uh, Wacy Gao uh, from, uh, where, where are you from? I don't think your pardon. <laughs> Cranfield, Cranfield. <laughs> I forgot where you were. Uh, so uh, the format we're going to go through is for each of our panelists to give us uh, an introduction on uh, their background and their perspectives uh, on the network. Uh, then, we'll, then we'll go into uh, a more interactive discussion period uh, between the panelists and the questions uh, that have been circulated and everybody will have the chance to contribute uh, at that particular time. Okay, so we'll we'll start uh, with Wei Gao, who's online, uh, who's going to introduce himself and get that little bit uh, done first. Okay, Wei do you want to give us uh, your background? Yeah. Uh, well, um, yeah, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, sorry that I'm online today and um, thank you for making provisions for me. Um, um, and thank you panel members as well for bearing with me. Um, I, I, I haven't had a chance to listen to some of the exciting talks so far, so, but I will try to give my perspective. Hopefully it doesn't um, overlap or it doesn't, you know, a cacophony with what's already said. Um, I'll, I'll give a quick overview of some of our research in our lab that might be relevant as well. Um, um, so hopefully I, I can... Oh, um, could you give me permission to share screen or um, I'll give a quick talk um, before you, you give that. So I'm, I'm Professor of Human Machine Intelligence at Cranfield. I was also a Turing Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute. My research really spans um, three areas. The first is um, applied machine learning for a variety of critical infrastructure areas. The second is looking at how networks enable decentralized learning and sustainable and onboard learning. And the third area is looking at the security of these aspects. Um, thank you for giving me permission. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. I can see I'm co-host now. So I'll try and give a, like a quick presentation of the kind of research we do in our lab. Um, hopefully you can see this, okay. Um, so um, we, we, one of our research areas is trustworthy and sustainable AI, and that has extremely strong application to um, transportation. As you know, Cranfield is a top 30 QS world ranked university for aerospace and mechanical engineering. We specialize in defense and aerospace. And um, my research really looks at, for example, how to have sustainable AI. Uh, sustainability is a huge topic, but it's also a practical topic in the sense that as we get to smaller drones, airborne platforms, we need su sustainable um, AI capabilities. Um, for example, we have this paper in Nature Computational Science on how to achieve federated learning on the fly. So classically, you would overdefine some kind of AI platform and the energy consumption would be absolutely huge. But what we're trying to achieve here are two things. Number one is to splice neural networks into federated or decentralized capabilities um, as we perform training, not after training. Um, and that can save you a lot more energy. And the second is to have decomposable understanding to your tools, neural networks, so that we can have analytical understanding of their performance bounds, explainability, have a pathway towards interpretability and explainability to end users. So these govern the kind of research vectors we have um, but focus on the areas of transportation. Um, so some of our research highlights mainly focus on graph learning and graph decompositions. Um, we work with a lot of stakeholders in the transportation sector, for example, Department for Transport, um, for example, the National Police that governs um, the legal usage of drones. And part of our work looks at how do we detect malicious use of drones? How do we separate malicious usage from naive usage, um, and you'll, you often see mixed classes of that, especially in urban areas. And how do we um, look for new ways of drone detection? And how do we understand drone detection, for example, from a deep feature graph perspective? So this is a topological data analysis of deep features and the way they contribute towards the understanding of a classification of a drone. 
Uh, and then what we're interested in is how secure is our knowledge of deep features. Um, so for example, you have Heathrow Airport, for example, if it was protected by high resolution cameras that were looking for horizon scanning of drones. Um, can drones be camouflaged um, from a neural perspective so that they evade neural networks detection, right? So effectively giving them neural stealth. These are the fundamental security um, and data science and also, you know, um, Internet of Things and IoT perspective for transportation that's coming into its view, right? Um, so so the, very much the frontier of new security issues in transportation. And with that, not only are we helping them to design new detection capability for, for malicious drones, but we're also developing, um, you know, the other side of that sword, which is how can we have neural features on drones? How can we give drones physical and, um, you know, image camouflage to allow them not to evade human detection, but human detection can't be um, the, the primary way of scanning a vast horizon. Um, ultimately, it will be AI that scans horizons and that would open new surfaces of, of attack. And that's what we're looking at. Um, we also have um, in my group, a Royal Academy of Engineering Fellowship, which is looking at how do we actually predict the intention of autonomous systems. So it's not to say, you know, what their velocity vectors are, what kind of capabilities or features they have, but rather, can we think about their mission profile, which is programmed in an internal state of the system? But can we have a pattern of observable behavior, which can estimate internal mission states and the mission profile probability? And that is what a lot of government and a lot of stakeholders <coughs> are after. They're not after can we shoot every single drone out of the sky <laughs> because you'd be there all day doing that, um, but rather which ones have the, the intention of harm, right? So the, these are the kind of questions that relate to AI and autonomy that we're grappling with. Uh, we also have a project with um, some of your hosts here um, on, you know, large scale adversarial attacks on deep reinforcement learning that manage transportation sectors. So for example, mobility as a service, if you have AI engines that manage how to um, manage demand, manage service allocation um, across all the transportations. How, how does one attack the AI algorithms that determine the optimization for these kind of large scale competitive services? And what kind of agents can attack that? And what kind of privacy enhancement and security enhancement techniques we can do in re deep reinforcement learning? Um, and finally, um, I'll shut up. I think my 10 minutes will be up, <laughs> um, is that we, we do a lot of autonomy, both in ground and air. We look at mainly human machine interaction, um, both on the security and deception side, but also on the trust and um, uh, behavior science and the cognitive burden aspect of it. So, so what we're trying to get at at the end of it is um, understanding how networked autonomy can help transportation in a very secure and trustworthy way. Thank you. Hopefully that was vaguely relevant and useful. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, I see. If we move on to Peter, do you want to give us a Thank you very much. That's an excellent introduction. So I'll do some one slightly different in relation to that. So my name is Peter Davis. Um, I'm a security specialist working for Talus um, in the UK, um, but actually I've operated globally. Um, and it's about six, seven years ago that I became involved in automotive um, security, particularly looking at autonomous cars, pods, things of that nature, and networks and things that went around that kind of stuff. And I became involved um, because what we were perceiving was a change whereby things that we cared about had been done at small scale. Yeah, we had to make safety cases around those sorts of things. And we, we basically, had a good understanding of how to do these and we've had it for 50 years of how to make the maths do the things that we needed in order to put them into place. Um, what was becoming obvious was the next generation was going to achieve effects at scale. Yeah, so many of the benefits and things that we were looking at required that we tied the, the energy networks to the, to the automotive network. We, we controlled the way that people went through the cities. We did, and we put all these things together. Uh, and worse than that, we were basically putting these things together on the fly at the point we wanted to do these things. Um, and no matter how much 
yeah, we may think we wanted to design these sets of things. Um, we, we did a poll, I think about eight years ago, uh, and, and the conclusion was that nobody was in a position to actually control or design this network. Um, so what you were looking at was complex networks with emergent properties that were now going to control what we were after. Um, and a very fundamental question, how do you therefore make the claims that you need to? How will you get the evidence that you need to? In order, for instance, to stand up in court and say, I was not just hoping this would work when I actually put all these things on the road. The second thing that we demonstrated was much of what we looked at at failure modes inside devices and, and inside components um, over, as I say, the last 50, 60 years were based on things that had been trialed in electromechanical systems. And even before that, <clears throat> the failure mode was generally one at a time. Yeah, I have always been able to saw through the brake pipes of a car and cause it to crash, and it crashes one at a time. The issue that we were starting to see when we were looking at cyber attacks, and I am a cyber attacker, yeah, was that the mode of failure in digital systems was global first, or at least was potentially global first. So what we were now dicing with was not only do we not know how to put these things together and do the maths, but actually we were looking at the probability that we would actually see a global and catastrophic failure when we were looking at um, when something went wrong. Um, so it wasn't that I didn't appreciate the really positive things uh, that we might get out of this. It was far more that at some point that will go wrong. We then set out to look at, and we looked at communications networks. How does that actually work in cyber physical networks? Uh, and if you go online, you'll find there are six types of cyber attacks that we put together, they have put together, that are fundamentally present in every system that is a cyber physical system of any complexity and that you can't get rid of. And what that meant was we were in a situation where the idea that we designed it so that it would be strong and robust and not go wrong, not a chance. So we had to be looking at something that was different. And we had to be looking that was much more fundamentally operating in the operational space. So one of the things I'd like you to take away is that over the 1,200 or so um, cases I have of cyber attacks and successful cyber attacks, only one of those involved changing code. The rest involve moving the environment, changing the way that things interact with each other, and from the point of view of what does that mean for people having to do this, if you are an automotive OEM, you are not responsible for the traffic lights. You are not responsible for GPS. You are not responsible, but you are legally responsible for what your car does. Um, you see the law commission at the moment changing and looking to change some of these things and saying the AI provider will need to be responsible for the AI, but without providing any suggestion of how that could possibly be the case. And if I were an AI provider, I would not be very comfortable in relation to that. So these are the things that we examined. We examined the fact that, so when we started doing this, most people talked about privacy as the security thing. Firstly, we suggested you need to stop talking about security because nobody knows what that is. You need to talk about outcomes, the things that we need to get from these things. And just for once, we need to test this stuff in terms of outcomes. Is it okay? Will it be okay over the next 20 years? How would that be affordable to keep it being okay over the next? But equally, what we observed was the general strategy by which you might keep things private and the strategy by which you might keep things safe generally use different aspects of security. Yeah, so um, I, I had an excellent discussion um, and it really goes partly to some of the discussion that was there in, in, in the first and panelists there. We had an excellent discussion that essentially said, yeah, we found this excellent way on the CAN bus of being able to detect there are things on there that excellent. The problem was detecting that was with one step in being able to stop that operating. And that is true for autonomous networks, that's true for things that are self-configuring every bit as much as it was for the CAN bus. So if what you wanted to do was make sure there was nothing on there that you didn't want, that would be great. However, the aspect that is really important in these systems is denial of service. I cannot be sailing along at 80 miles an hour and suddenly discover that I don't have brakes. And I certainly can't be doing that if that's a global thing. Yeah, I cannot also be in a situation in which my control systems are now universally stopping the cars on the roads. Yeah, that, that is a denial of service that has implications for 
you know, for medicine, for fuel distribution. So these catastrophic outcomes, we need to make sure that we engineer things, that we put together a methodology of doing these things that was based on three principles and six arguments that you could take to court. And then we looked at how does the science that you guys work on fit into that sort of stuff. And we observed that in general, people were trying to do things with the arguments that they were making from science that the, that the science could not achieve. Yeah, didn't mean it wasn't useful, but it did mean that actually it was not useful when you're trying to take these things to court. And we will be tested there. And the final thing I'd like to say is as we put all of these things together, yeah, the observation was we are already in a situation where systems based on based on the level of complexity we have are uninsurable. Yeah, so the world has already noticed that these things are on. If I'm doing stuff I care about, it's uninsurable. And the we are being encouraged often to do things that we have done well on small scale systems. So would avionics work well with automotive? I suspect if you look at the at the 737 MAX, I suspect if you look at, at the uh, plea from Boeing to be allowed to relax their safety things, if you look at the fact that the Lightning fighter can't be um, authorized for mass production, you're looking at a situation where we are beyond the level of complexity that we can handle. And therefore, this is a pressing problem. I guess that's the end of my introduction. <laughs> so thanks very much, Peter. Sandra? Thank you. Um, so I'm Sandra Scott Hayward, I'm a senior lecturer at Queen's University in Belfast, um, and I also direct the Academic Centre of Excellence in Cybersecurity Education there. The main focus uh, of my research is around network security, um, and for about 10 years we've been looking at software-defined networks. Um, so the idea of the programmable network, which started with programmable control planes, fits in quite well to this idea of autonomous networks and cognitive networks, because you have this kind of feedback loop where you can extract information from your network elements, process that at the sort of a control level with that's distributed or, or whatever way it's implemented, and then program back uh, the network into how you want it to operate. Um, now, there are obviously a lot of challenges there, and I think a few of them have been touched on uh, by, by Peter and I see, but we, the direction, one of the issues associated to it is if we want everything sort of to happen, uh, autonomously uh, with maybe machine to machine control without the human interaction, lovely latency elements and they feed quite uh, heavily into any automotive or aviation type of, of, of environment. Uh, the programmable control plane there doesn't really satisfy that latency element because you tend to have the expectation that the controllers will be remote. Uh, there may be many of them, um, and we can get into long conversations, but all of these different overlays, like the edge cloud. In, uh, environment where we actually place all of our distributed elements. Um, but in general sense, that open foot is open flow is the protocol that communicates between the data and the control planes in the network that is has a latency associated to it. So the direction of the last number of years has been towards programmable data plane to go and try to push back into the data plane some of that uh, technology, some of the, the decision making. Um, now, it doesn't revert back to a sort of a traditional style network where you have that co-located uh, control and data. It's more about the idea of having openness uh, in, in the, the design of that system. So you could have different uh, chipsets and different uh, control functions provided by different people uh, cooperating. And then the progressive data plane uh, and new languages like P4 that I would use to write that you would write those pipelines so anybody can write their own program to program a device to do exactly what they want uh, the, the forwarding behavior to be within the data plane. Um, so I look at some of the aspects of security, uh, so the main focus of my look working in SDN is security, um, uh, both sort of how that architecture can facilitate, so add to network security, uh, and also the, the issues associated. Um, and I think to, to link into some of what Peter was saying, in terms of the issues is if we do have this um, autonomous behavior or we're enabling what we call sort of stateful behavior within the network itself, how do we actually know what's happening there? If decision-making can be made on the basis of whatever inputs we get in, let's say, a particular network device. Um, so whatever traffic, network traffic arrives, depending on the, the context of that traffic, what it is, then some particular action is takes place within the within the data plane. 
we need to have a visibility of that. And one of the questions early on with SBN kept coming up from the telcos is with how do I how do I know how do I know what's going on? How do I verify this? Um, I was talking to somebody in the room just earlier about the formal methods uh, about being able to actually prove uh, the state uh, of the network and the behaviors. So there are some open questions I think there around how we can actually facilitate this. And um, one of the other things to I think to to highlight. I think the overall conversation kind of is around autonomous networks, and there are quite a few standardization standard organization bodies uh, promoting or, or or developing frameworks um, for the definition of uh, I think it's it's, it's SE and ITUT uh, with kind of experiential network intelligence. How those frameworks look when I look at those, and I'm and I'm not by any means an expert in them, but when I look at them, they look really complex. They remind me of an NFE architecture, the SC network functions virtualization architecture, that is infinite APIs, so application programming interfaces, and infinite connections, infinite elements. And how do you actually get a handle on all of that? Uh, it, it's vast uh, and it's complex. Um, so, you know, one directly is, is you, you break them down into small pieces and you try and manage those. Um, I think from a security perspective, we, we the reason this sort of become the descriptions of self-healing and self-configuration, et cetera, come into it is that we have to assume that the system is uh, is is broken or or is is vulnerable in some sense. So then we have to design around that um, and look at our failure cases linked to the probability, the strong probability of of an attack being take, taking place or something. And what do we do? What's the response to that? Having those kind of response mechanisms uh, considered. Um, the other uh, area I look at is is adversarial attacks um, on the sort of machine learning. So mm -hmm. the reason for sort of my looking at that direction of things is uh, machine learning and AI, obviously super buzzwords, but also very much of interest to network security uh, solutions providers. Um, so looking at those they're applying and, and deploying machine learning technologies uh, into security systems. So particularly network intrusion detection systems. And to me, this is really frightening when we know uh, all of the uh, vulnerabilities associated to, to machine learning techniques. So not only the ideas of, you know, of, of bias and uh, when we look at it, and that, you, know, you might not think that that necessarily applies in a network security context when you're looking at network traffic, um, but the example I'd give there just to hook into is the idea of a um, maybe a zero hours contract worker and uh, they've got an IDS on their system um, the IDS detects that there's an issue and locks them out of their system. Uh, and somebody can then no longer access. So it does have personal consequences um, if, if the system is, is not designed appropriately. Um, but so yeah, there's brittleness, there's um, ex lack of explainability going again towards how and what, what, what the decisions that are being made are, are, are whether they're reliable or not, uh, what's involved in them. Mm -hmm. So the idea that machine learning can be attacked with evasion attacks, um, poisoning attacks, where we look at uh, poisoning other data set, uh, changing what the, the content, so you know, malicious for benign, switching <laughs> to the data set if you're using a supervised model. Uh, evasion, which is really simple in the context of the network, where you can just manipulate um, packets uh, or elements, packet header fields, which we use uh, in classification uh, algorithms or in, in neural network algorithms. Um, and you can very easily, just by being a host on the network, you can generate traffic. Uh, that can fool an IDS uh, and enable all of these, you know, denial of service uh, attacks potentially. Um, so the the focus that we need to get to, or the, the the area that we need to get to from the network perspective, I think in image and vision processing, which has been established for much longer, there is a lot of work around robustness um, and design of, of AI and ML and use of AI and ML and being robust, uh, robustly tested, um, adversarially tested in advance of deployment. Uh, so I think we need to get towards that, develop these sort of standard uh, adversarial tech, tech frameworks for benchmarking uh, before we can consider the use of the systems, mm -hmm. these AI ML systems that will go into our autonomous and cognitive networks uh, and help us to, um, to more dynamically uh, generate uh, the, the network design or orchestrate or manage our networks. Um, and just to, to finish on that note, so I, I do work with the with the IEEE on a, on a, a governance um, uh, guidelines document that we're producing for the use of uh, of AI. Um, and I think within that, there are a set of principles uh, and practices that we identify that all uh, machine learning models should be consistent with, and they they feed off the OECD principles 
Um, but the ideas of explainability link very heavily into this into the concept of verification and validation, um, so that we can be sure of what our network's doing. So I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, thanks very much, Sandra. <coughs> yep. If I can just take over this. So I'll, I'll provide a much briefer uh, introduction because Gareth, I'll answer the questions one by one separately. All right. Okay. So, um, but not now afterwards. So uh, I went for the traditional way of doing this thing. So I'm just um, the essentially the basis of, of, of what I'm talking about is the notion of self-awareness, all right? Not self-awareness, uh, not only in terms of users of systems, but of the resource of systems, right? The, 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 which allows the, if the, 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 the users, the subjects, and the, the, and the resources mm -hmm. to know what's their operational state. We need to share the screen. The online paper comes. Yeah, Okay, sorry, sorry, guys. All right, so, and and that is that that and that is essentially and um, and and uh, I hope I come I came with the longest title of this mm -hmm. of this thing. All right, all right. So if I can manage to move this, all right. So um, I just want to make a disclaimer here. All right. So um, um, about autonomous driving and zero touch network. So I never worked with them. All right, and uh, I never heard about them until preparing this panel. And so, what I did essentially, I googled. All right, so when I googled, of course, uh, what you come about is a solution in terms of of um, autonomous networks. I come with beautiful photos, which are completely useless. All right, and I start seeing things which are start touching me because there's a notion of feedback loops. All right, collection. You've got all the networks here. Uh, applications at the top. I think oh, I've been getting involved in this. Complications of this of, of, of service providers all along. So this is a chain actually that you look into it. So a chain, or oh, you we, we need to have systems interacting with systems, it is notion of system systems. And now you've got the layer the issues here from the application, right? The physical level. So and, and this is and this is all in the context of 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 of, of um zero 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 touch networks. And other pictures and other feedback loops, things that I talk about, I care about, is also intelligence, control, and assurances. All right. So I I I was very excited until and they'll have to come with this this this, this picture, yeah, <clears throat> which I thought they're not they don't know what they're talking about. All right. When they start putting things in the middle there and connecting learning before analysis of the analysis, say, all right, okay, I'll stop here and I'll try and do my job. All right. So my background essentially is on self-adaptation software systems. I've been working for this for donkey years, 30 years, all right? So, and we try essentially to change uh, software systems uh, using essentially software engineering, control engineering, no AI, all right? So the AI is coming late, but you are able actually to change our systems on the fly, all right, without any human interference and reconfigure the system. If you talk, you talk about soft architectures, uh, Code level is very low level. Very, I think it's inefficient to deal with the code. All right, uh, so you abstract. You've been abstracting. You work on uh, soft architectures. You've got um, architectural description languages, and uh, sometimes domain specific languages in which you reconfigure. All right, you just change components, change connections. You've done this. All right, so this is this is this is issues. Now, one issue that from our community has been for a long time. This all right is just two important points. All right, first the feedback loop. All right, so you rely very much on contra engineering principles. All right, this is the contra, the feedback loop has to be explicit. I've come across you have worked already on several systems in which the loops were inside the code. All right, because mm -hmm. inside the code that doesn't pro provide the transparency that is needed to understand how the system is supposed to behave. Another thing is models. All right, so you can't don't, don't talk about self adaptation, autonomic without models, and this and that's the two issues that you did. This models need to be updated at runtime, all right? It's not models, this is development time, runtime. So we essentially what we're shifting, essentially is everything from, from development time to runtime. A lot of the stuff, decision-making is becoming our runtime issue. Now, and the focus, all right, is being resilience. So I come with this resilience, which is the, the provision of, the persistent provision of services, which can be just really trusted, all right? And, um, but essentially I come from the safety background, the penalty background and more recent security, right? So, 
And when we, and our essential issue is the changes. So any static or even adversary model is not enough, all right? Is not enough, all right? It's bound to fail, all right? Because the, the, the assumptions are static, all right? So you need to live in the world in which it's always changing. And the systems need to have the mechanisms which allow to do this. On the fly, change, protect, mitigate, all right? So my world is dynamic. Any solution that's relying somehow on and, and static, for me, I, I, my baseline is rubbish, all right? Um, so, and the, what, what we have got actually, a lot of people talk about data. All the existing data is completely useless for us. You know this, all right? Because what you need is runtime data. You need to create our data during runtime, all right? Otherwise, all the data that exists is useless, all right? You might, you might be able to uh, find a model for a particular, uh, for a particular detector, detector, which is static, but you, it dies eventually, all right? Because you're not, um, uh, you need to create, and that's what we did in the past. You create our systems in order to, you, you build systems in order to create the data in which you could analyze what was going on, all right? An important thing also is a justification of trust. There is not enough to claim that all my system is safe, mm -hmm. all right? It's not enough, all right? This is what was mentioned by me before. We need to, you need this, this issue of evidence, uh, evidence, arguments, and claim. This is part, this is supposed to be intrinsic, all right, to the deployment of future systems. The notion that, uh, the, the, what you call the, the safety cases, security uh, related cases, uh, uh, resilience cases, whatever the penalty cases, these are pre deployments, all right? So, in the future systems, that is in the dynamic world, that doesn't apply, why? Right? Because the system changes. And of course, which I mentioned, I like to mention this, all right, which there is no humans in the loop. All right, so whatever we're going to do, humans might affect negatively more the system than protecting the system, actually, because you hint into this, all right, in the sense that the system is so complex that how can a human on the snapshot understand what's the state of the system? Because the system evolves. It doesn't mean that because you deploy a system with architecture X and it goes X1, X2, X3, X4, Xn, and the human, when there is a problem, no, the human knows in Xn. Right? And this happens. So you always reconfigure our systems until a point, you, what now? What's next? All right. So this is, um, this is, so I just want to make clear what I understand. Models, all right, you work models uh, the, for those country engineering backgrounds, proportion negative derivative. This is the type of architectures. This is a long time ago. This it was my students about 10, 20 years ago. A very simple architecture in which you manipulate manipulate components and, 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 and the interactions. You have done better things than, than now, all right? And of course, database, all right? Databases. These are basic models. If you're going for self awareness in the system that you developed, you're trying to trace every user, every resource, all right? And by doing this, you can compare a, a user A against user B. You can compare user A in, in, in January against user A in February. You can do where that means you, this user is misbehaving. All right, so the notion of a database, a very explicit database, this is important. This is doing in the feedback loop, all right? So let's start from the sense, uh, think and act. This is the basic robotic one. Uh, you've got autonomic loop, all right? And you've got, this is the most successful software engineering, by software engineers from the software community, engineering community in terms of feedback of the loop, all right? Which is uh, CMU Rainbow. What you have done on this, all right? You try to destruct this, the, 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 this, the, this, this controller, all right? Is almost a generic controller. We try to destruct the evidence about trying to inject faults into it, and it's been it's been it's been used so so far. You know, you be I'm still working on this actually, all right? In a different context. So, this is a bit that for us the notion of uh, a feedback has to be explicit. We need to know, and of course, the models are here. The models are there, all right? So the models have to be explicit because the models will be manipulated. So because without models, the system is not able to reason about itself. That's essentially what you're looking for. The system enable, uh, allow to reason about itself, all right? So I'll stop here, all right? And when the questions came, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the questions because for every question, I've tried to put some things together, <laughs> all right? Okay, see you. Okay, thanks, thanks very much, Xavier. And uh, go? Yeah. So um, let me introduce a bit about myself. And my name is uh, Don Huajan. Currently, I'm working as an expert and acting as a team lead of autonomous driving network uh, involving Paris Research Center. Okay. So 
uh, what our team is currently doing is about building the resonant autonomous ground networks, okay, which is somehow different from the uh, auto, uh, vehicle networks. Uh, so uh, when we talk about the autonomous driving networks, so uh, in the Rogers slides, actually, you have claim that you have no idea about ADN, but I can give a little bit of explanation about that. So if uh, you have not heard about autonomous driving network, probably you have heard about the zero trust uh, network and the services, right? That actually is the uh, SE uh, reference of framework. Um, so basically, the um, ultimate purpose of this framework is to improve the operational efficiency okay, and reduce the operational complexity and the cost. So uh, at the end of the day, we'd like to exclude the human operators out of the loop. Okay, because considering the increasing complexity of today's network infrastructure, it will be very costly to always involve the human operators in the loop. Okay. That's actually is the basic idea of uh, the idiom. So <clears throat> uh, then how can we characterize alien autonomous driving networks? So most of the time, actually, we can uh, give the four properties that uh, is uh, self-trope. So self-configuration, self-optimization, self-healing, and self-protection, right? So uh, uh, just like the auto uh, autonomous vehicles, we can classify actually the ADN or autonomous driving network into five levels. So at the very beginning, if the assistant autonomous, that means we, we need to have the human actually always take control or get involved. And then we have the partially autonomous uh, network, and then you know conditional autonomous network, the highly autonomous networks and the fully autonomous networks. So now actually we are working at the state four, between three and four. <coughs> That's in effect. Um, but for the group, for our team, now we are working towards L5. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if we look at the communities, in fact, building autonomous driving network is, you know, just to let it's, it's, it's not a one day merge. So uh, we have to bring together actually the researchers from the different uh, research communities. For example, for analysis and the monitoring. So uh, we have a bunch of researchers have been working on network uh, analysis, network monitoring, right? traffic analysis, this kind of stuff. Then we have another group of researchers who have been working on network policies, programming languages, now uh, this kind of stuff. Then how we can basically uh, bridge the gap between uh, those two communities or two research activities. Uh, activities right? So <clears throat> uh, then take this the big context uh, in mind, okay? Uh, uh, how can we develop such a security you know, architecture? As I just mentioned, we have four fundamental properties to describe or characterize autonomous driving networks. So especially for self-protection, it's really a general term. So how can, can, can we really uh, build a such a thing uh, for the autonomous driving networks? Assume that mm -hmm. human operators are no longer involved okay, in the operation and the maintenance. Um, <clears throat> I think basically we can take two approaches. Right? or two methodologies that have already been researched in the community for a long time. One is about the secure by design, right? but we uh, still have lots of topics there, uh, just like uh, Sandra has mentioned, right? due to the introduction of mm -hmm. machine learning algorithms and the machine learning techniques. So the novel threat actually uh, will be all, uh, also involved or will be also introduced uh, to the autonomous driving networks. So, <clears throat> Security by, de by design, especially for AI systems, I think is a still ongoing research topic. In the community, for example, people have started working on the data-driven, you know, uh, machine learning in terms of uh, interpretability or explainability. Okay, uh, 
And also, uh, the, the, uh, some researchers actually have started to think about uh, the formal logic uh, for the AI system verification, how to verify the uh, AI uh, you know, system behavior uh, by using the formal logic itself. Okay. Or even further, we can think about the combination of the two, the data-driven approaches and the model-driven approaches. So another, in fact, a very typical solution for, <laughs> uh, for uh, uh, you know, achieving what we call self production is, of course, the, the, the uh, security by reaction, right? So uh, this actually includes a large set of typical security functions and services, such as RPS, the, uh, RPDS, right? Data production, network isolation, mm -hmm. right? But the thing, uh, you, you know, is, how to put those pieces together and how to manage them together. If we refer to the Gartner's framework, uh, what we call the cybersecurity mesh network, right? Uh, uh, cybersecurity mesh architecture, sorry. Yeah, uh, which has been proposed uh, in uh, 2022, right, this year. So um, <clears throat> basically there are four uh, very important ingredients. The bottom layer uh, is about the uh, security intelligence and ethics. Okay, that's actually what we've been always doing. Um, the second is about the uh, identity, distributed identity management. Right? That actually is also the core idea of the uh, zero trust network. Right? And, and then we have the the uh, you know uh, the policies, right? how to manage the policies. Basically, as we said, the security functions are fragmented. Then we need to have a central way to manage them. You know, centralizing. But if we enforce a centralized the security policy, you know, how those policies actually could be enforced to different PPs, mm -hmm. policy enforcement points, right? So that those security, basically security functions can understand them and then eventually, you know, uh, execute them without mm -hmm. any errors. So um, I think then back to the security and autonomous driving networks is the topic of today's panel is. Uh, you know, how we can possibly develop such a self-adaptive security architecture. That's actually uh, could be a question that we can uh, continue discussion, right? Okay, I can stop here. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, if anybody does want to ask any questions at any time, uh, you can do so now. Does anyone have any comments initially? So uh, I do have a question. Okay, so Peter mentioned that um, because these systems are, are so new, they are, they are trying to build things which you know, using tools which are not you know, probably as, as developed as we would like them to be. To forget about security and focus on functionality or correctness of functionality. But wouldn't we be making the same mistake uh, that we did with the internet? So the internet was uh, fundamentally not designed to be secure. And um, that is causing a lot of you know, a lot of issues that we have, security issues that we have today. So why not uh, include uh, security as a functionality, and then ensure correctness, which mm -hmm. would be something like security by design. So I think that's an excellent example. Yeah. So the internet obviously came out of darknet, which was designed to be resilient. Resilience is a function of security, one function of that one. The primary thing, the primary consideration at that time was did we have a did we have a resilient military network in the, in the close to people blowing up parts of the nodes and things of that nature? And in terms of what it was designed to do and what people thought they were going to use it for, it's actually done a pretty good job. It very seldom goes down. It's a, you know, it scales way beyond anything that anybody thought they would be using it for. Um, but actually you have the other side of this, which is the internet as we now understand it, the, the way it was put together and that you know, people use things that were there and we're able to adapt those and use them for different purposes in order to do that. And that's what you're seeing. You're seeing an ongoing transition of that isn't what I thought I was doing with it, but I'm doing something else. And then you start to layer in some of the, some of the really significant items. You know, yeah, you, you get the, the single brick errors on things in digital systems, yeah, have unforeseen consequences. In fact, somebody had a lovely, lovely phrase, yeah, that said that said 
complex systems are, are, are deterministic but not determinable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which, um, which I want to put at the top of my page, as it were. Because it means that from a point of view of a cyber attack, from a point of view, but not even a cyber attack. So when I do cyber attacks, what I generally do is characterize complex systems and emerging problems. Yeah. And I say a cyber attack is actually an emerging problem. One I didn't expect. Yeah, or it's certainly it's one that my the people on the other side didn't expect. So you're going to see them whether or not it, somebody has an intent to do these sorts of things. And you see it as things morph into doing different things. Um, but what you now have and the sorts of things that you now have on, on, on the internet are, yes, I've got privacy problems in relation to that. But if I was trying to use the internet as people are trying to use IP in order to control safety critical, timing critical sets of things, that's a whole different type of problem and that is amenable to it. Yeah. And that has a different meaning. So what I was trying to suggest when I was talking about the the conflicting objectives of these things is actually as they grow, what you get is different objectives, and the, the objectives themselves are not consistent. There isn't a way to resolve one without destroying the other. And that comes to so when we talk about security, that security with respect to something, we need to actually understand security always comes with consequences. There is always a negative outcome. You know, so so. There was a reference there to brittleness. So, so, so you make things strong, you make them brittle. Yeah, yeah. We we actually understand all of these things, and yet we talk about it as though we can do do things generally. So, a lot of the tools that we're talking about are really, really useful. They're fundamental tools. They're the sorts of things. But the step of whether or not and how you're going to use that sort of stuff is by no means a simple step. Sandra. Uh, no specific uh, comment on that. I would um, pick up on one of Ruggieri's points, if that's okay. okay yeah. um, just on the, the, the point you made about, yeah. I, I didn't intend to suggest that mm. it was static, okay, any I, of I, the, I, anything. Yeah. Um, and certainly, I think to, to add on to that in terms of the programmable network and the, the play to play aspects, one of the things we're looking at is a lot of the verification tools at the moment look at it at uh, program compile time and do an analysis of the, the security, let's say, or the, the functionality of the program mm -hmm. at in that uh, compile time point. So some of the work we're looking at is, well, once that actually runs, we don't know the behavior of that within the data plane live under varying uh, uh, parameters, varying, varying things happening in the network. So we're looking at how we can actually look at that behavior um, and protect against the potential exploitation uh, within a within a runtime program. So just one example to give there of that. Now I pick up your point from robustness point of view. Mm -hmm. Right. It's robustness, you build a system to, to protect <laughs> itself and this is the deploying the system is robust. You build all the arguments. And on the uh, sorry of uh, sorry of Chinese policy. All right. So this is our solutions for me, extremely standard. What you need is the resilience. What you need is the, the changes in the system. What you need is the system reacting to changes, reacting to a new adversary attack. And that's why. And the robustness for me is the building for is the building stage for resilience. All right. You can't keep resilience, not robust, right? Bring everything in and let's deal with it. It doesn't work. All right. So you have some kind of robustness, but you need to go beyond, you need to think beyond robustness. All right. You need to think beyond there are people already questioning the facility, the facility training. Because not enough, right? So it might be something that's not enough, right? So yeah. again, again, I would yeah. say that it doesn't. Robustness doesn't mean static. There's no, there's no reference in there to the set. And I think you're right in terms of the adversarial training approaches. It's definitely an open space because you know for some of the benchmarks that are in place for the image and vision systems, there, the, the conversation there about how do we know that is the the full suite yeah. of adversarial attacks yeah, and test on. You know, it's, it's completely uh, open and ongoing. Um, so yeah, I think there's a in the the design of the system we talk about the dynamism in the testing of the system. We have to have the dynamism and all that in yeah. place as well. And maybe that goes towards. I mean, digital twins is such a, a a hot topic at the moment as well. Maybe we have space here to have some of this running live, so we learn from the behaviors of what's happening online that we can feed in and, and vice yeah. versa as well. I want to go back to, so if you me allow Sanjay's. Yeah. Lee yeah. Chen, did you want to comment on that particular oh, part? And we have another. Yeah. Sorry, is that me or? Yes. 
Um, I, I, I think I can comment on a related topic, which is that um, in one of our research projects, so, so we, we run with Lancaster, the EPS RC Trustworthy Autonomous Systems node for security. And our premise is really to look at how algorithms will, in, 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 you know, many of these autonomous algorithms won't be working in a fixed defined notion. A lot of the security and runtime security is only effective up to, you know, when you have a defined operational envelope. But if that envelope shifts in swarm autonomy, in adversarial environments, you know, one of our sponsors is TADIS, um, and I'm sure our TADIS panel member here can think of what I'm talking about, that then your runtime kind of security doesn't, it, it's very hard to do that, right? And um, I, I think um, if you're thinking about adversarial AI attacks, you open yourself to a, such a diverse portfolio of attacks, right? Not only from your poisoning and other attacks people have mentioned, but also denial attacks in the sense that your, your, the synchronization, say, of a federated AI, um, for example, it is reliant on you not only having a synchronized and secure network, but also access to GNSS and PNT data of location, position, timing. If that secondary support data is off, you're going to run into all sorts of problems in your you know, holistic autonomous system, even for a very sw small swarm. So, so, so it's, a, it's a very big issue <laughs> and they're all connected together as the previous speaker was saying, um, but, but I, I think one still has to break them down into small tight research challenges. Otherwise it becomes a bit overwhelming, <laughs> I think. Um, thank you. Can I just check? Nishan, did you, did you want to ask a question? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Gary. And thank you very much for all the panel members for your uh, introduction. It's uh, a lot of information and see all you have the, the background, the skills and the, uh, the views. It looks to me one thing is in common from your introduction is about uh, the autonomous driver where you use AI regardless uh, uh, what you try to achieve. And also you want to make uh, uh, a trusted system. The uh, We see talk about uh, the trustworthy AI and the Zhonghua talk about uh, zero trust. And the Peter's comments I like most is don't talk about security and see the outcome. So that means you seem to be able to find the outcome is trustworthy or not trustworthy. Uh, and my question is, we want to AI, we want to trust the system, but uh, one thing puzzles me, uh, I learned from yesterday's uh, keynote speech, uh, speech is uh, Nick, Nicholas uh, Carlini. He talked about uh, AI is uh, inclutable. Probably you, <laughs> I don't know whether you, you agree with him or not. He think machine learning algorithms, most of, most of them is not a human understandable. It's there, you use it, but uh, it is uh, inclu inscrutable. So my question is, how to make those things together, trustworthiness, zero, zero trust, build a system, you don't understand the inside of the algorithms, the inside of the technical details, whether this uh, and not understandable systems can be trusted. If you want to trust it for zero knowledge, uh, for the uh, zero trust, which is not like zero knowledge, it should be zero knowledge, but to verify. That is a, a, the philosophy of zero, zero trust. So it should be zero trust, but to verify. Can AI system, automatic AI system be verifiable? That's my question. You want to take that? I was going to mention this in my, in my, in my, um, okay. in my one of my answers is that we need, in order to be, have a justification of trust, we need to understand our system full stop. This is safety cases, right? Mm -hmm. This is the penalty cases. 
if we cannot, and that's the big buckling of, of, of safety critical systems, and this is perhaps from you know, 30 years ago, trying to build up uh, evidence or build up arguments based on evidence that what provides the is deterministic, whatever is it, it's predictable, is understandable, you can build an argument. And as, as people, and, and this doesn't work, so for, for safety critical systems, the decision has to be made, right? Essentially, where are you going to turn the blind eye for it, right? Like the, the 737 marks, they all right, there's no software in the system, right? So, this was turn the blind eye, all right? So, and they, they, they blew until they crash, all right? So, or turn the blind eye into it, all right? Or really start making decisions which kind of tools, AI tools or machine learning tools, should be used in a, any system. If the system is safety critical, you need to build the arguments and to make the claims, all right? If you cannot, if you don't understand it, there's no way. And you, you get stuck because you get stuck as you get stuck in the beginning 30 years ago. When you're trying to build arguments for very simple, very simple, what's not today, very simple machine learning, machine learning to, uh, models. Right? But do you not think there was something really quite fundamental in what you said there, which is if I don't know what it's, and this is not just true for safety critical yeah. systems, if I don't know what it's supposed to be doing, it's really hard to know that it's not doing it. Yeah. You know, so, so at some level, you've got to have this thing that you can test things. And when I'm doing cyber attacks, one of, one of the most interesting thing is, in most cases, people have no idea that that's an attack. Yeah, you know, they they have yeah you know, they they don't know what the system is supposed to be doing. Mm. And when we talk about these things, yeah, you know, we talk about the digital thing as though that's necessarily attached to the physical world where yeah. things are open. So we have lots of sensors. We have yeah. You know, mm. So this is what we're looking at, and this is why we need our autonomous networks because yeah. we have lots such large scale networks here. But one of the interesting things that you're then starting to look at surely is is, um, and I have this discussion interminably, yeah, so as far as I'm concerned, there is an infinite space between the digital model that I have put up, and it's all a model, yeah, mm -hmm. albeit an adaptive model, it's a, a model, mm -hmm. and the, yeah, and there's an infinite variability between these sorts mm -hmm. of things, and as soon as you start doing that, and it's, it was interesting, because it's, um, it's some of the vocabulary and things that we use in relation to that, so, so, um, <coughs> um why so where was saying it's difficult to do this it's really difficult to do to do these sorts of things yeah but really there has to be a difference between it's difficult to do these things but if i work on it a bit harder it'll be fine and it is theoretically impossible to do this and i and i know i do a thing that says okay guys this is you've just talked to me about how this is infinite yeah and i know that one over infinity ten over infinity a million over it is the same number Oh yes, after all. Yeah, so, so the fact you've got a thousand cases that you tested on your AO system, if I was talking about an infinite space, yeah, you know, means that, and to me that comes down to there are two aspects that we're looking at here. We're looking at firstly, is there some mechanism by which on my AI system might possibly do what I want it to do? Yeah, which is basically what we test in digital twins. Yeah. Or are you telling me? I understand how these things fail. I understand you know, how we will move away from these things. And that that seems to me to be an infinitely complex space. And given that we're wrestling with the first of those at the moment, and haven't even begun to consider the second of those, yeah, that's so that for me was okay, we need to start to look at something different here. Yeah, I have no way by which I could offer you a 10 to the minus nine probability that this system won't go wrong or a 10 to the minus six or I don't have any way of doing these sorts of things. So part of what we started to discuss there is how much difference must you have in your systems? Yeah, how much failure must you be prepared to, to consider? And to me, if we don't start to factor those sorts of things into it, yeah, then we will butt up against the limits of science. And indeed we have already done so. And, and I've seen nothing coming out of the quantum world that actually suggests that I will get over that problem. So unless somebody's coming out with a new, a new theory of science, which I will be delighted about, and please come and tell me about it. Yeah, then, then essentially, we need to work with the things that we actually know instead of pretending they don't exist. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to come in. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, when I'm reading across literature, and certainly when I'm on Twitter, where, where a lot of the debate happens, um, you, you definitely see three three camps, um, and I'll tell you which camp I'm kind of in between. Um, I think one camp is 
you cannot robustly verify deep algorithms simply because mathematically they're jumping over a function landscape in a discontinuous fashion. And any explanation, especially in real challenging problems, is not robust. Um, there is the other camp which is saying, well, we, we can't not explain things, <laughs> um, right? And that just because you cannot have mathematical guarantees around these explanations, um, you know, human civilization isn't exactly built our trust between each other is not built on mathematical guarantees either, right? The fact that you're listening to me with hopefully, you know, some degree of trust <laughs> is still based on proxy information and other things, right? Um, and I think, I think you know, we, we have to think in that way. How, how has human beings, you know, allowed ourselves to trust and verify each other, even though we have no real mathematical data techniques in a formal way, but yet we've built up thousands of years of trustworthy relationships, right? And they don't all work out. But of course, that then you go back to um, you know, the third camp, which is the more legislative and regulatory camp, for example, the European Union Commission on AI Trust, the Royal Society Report, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all about risk analysis, which is to say, well, you can't have a general philosophy on these kind of things because you get nowhere, and that you must look at the risk profile of what this actually thing does, right? Is it an autonomous weapon platform or is it just a house pet? you know, uh, autonomous pet, for example, you've got to look at the risk profile and have a level explanation and trust methodology that is appropriate for the societal damage that it may cause. So I think I'm definitely between the last two camps, <laughs> but um, I definitely take the um, academic point that, that, that it's very hard to have a, a, a universal truth to these kind of things. You just to pick up on that, I, I completely agree, and I think particularly on the on the legislative end of things, you see a lot of conversation around that um, in, in policy discussions. And um, I think it's worth maybe noting, though, that even if it's not feasible and we have this infinitely uh, impossible mm. <laughs> um, approach to some of these things, one of the reasons for even talking about the adversarial training and the requirements for robustness and the requirements for benchmarking is to hopefully get across the point to young researchers and students who are looking at AI and ML technologies and very excited by them, and to highlight that it's not just a performance metric of accuracy or F1 score, whatever what you, you take, is not the, the, the thing, the only thing that you should be presenting uh, based on your work. You must be considering these other aspects based on the, the you know the, the the overall framework of the use of AI and ML. So just to, to add that in. So how do you uh, you try and create a benchmarking framework? How do you go about defining what that benchmark is in terms of failure? Well, I haven't looked at it in terms of failure, but uh, when we're looking at um, that, this is what I was saying to Rogeria earlier that the idea that you at least have a, a classification of a certain you know you just got to start somewhere. Start by enumerating some of these things, some of these facts that we are conscious of and we are aware of, um, and looking at cases for each of those. Um, and the issue is obviously, as you say, as everybody's already kind of agreed on the fact that we don't know the, you know, what else might be done, what else might be done, what else might be done. So it's an open conversation, but at least having some set of, you know, for this particular use case, this is where you, you start looking at and you start exploring whether you can at least raise the level of um i mean on that uh, there are a couple of these uh, benchmarking open source benchmarking tools out there that list and they, they request or, or uh, at least encourage contributions to extend the the benchmarking tool um but you can clearly see a a 90x percent accuracy accuracy uh not adversarial or roughly trained or whatever and then you know 60s when you do the version where you've actually you know put the test cases to it it's just about raising awareness about that this is an open space that we should definitely be considering as uh like you just said the, the the use case you know where you're placing these and maybe that kind of you know ai ml is not the solution to whatever problem you're trying to solve and uh, because of all the vulnerabilities associated to it yeah, so Gareth, we, we have done some work on benchmarking self-protecting systems actually already. Mm -hmm. right? So we have done this. Okay. So um because and it's very complex. You base the work on dependability benchmarking. So you've got some of my colleagues from Queenborough, we're very experts in dependability benchmarking. You adapt that and trying to find the runs, what is actually mm -hmm. uh self-adapted, self-protecting. Then we've got a paper on this benchmark. It's very hard. 
All right, because now it's dynamic systems appear there. All right, so the whole thing changes. So, but there is no AI there. So, as I said, our approach to self adaptation so far is no AI, it's country engineering and software engineering. All right, so, and, and this is you could, you could have something, you could have built some, 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 some organ. Going back to your situation, I remember a long time ago when people start talking about intrusion tolerance. Mm -hmm. Everything was for tolerance or what, what, what intrusion tolerance. So intrusion tolerance, you get inside the system. Right? So, and that was a big mayhem, right? You can't allow this. But what I'm observing now is there's a shifting boundary, a shifting very, very fast. So once a lot of the decisions which before had done it at, 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 at development time, pre-deployment, now can be done at runtime, operational time. All right, so, and by doing this, you're shifting all the issues that are trying to protect the system, all right? Now you've got to self-protect the system. The system needs to understand what's going on. And this shifts, all the argumentation shifts this, all right? And that's why, and, and that's why it's very much what mentioned the third camp, the, th the risk-based. This is, there is the solution is really is a continued evaluation of risk. You can't mm -hmm. get away with a continuous evaluation of risk and the continuous updates of the safety basis. Of the security basis, because this only allows the system to provide the guarantee or the guarantees which you obtain the trust, right? Uh, that the system is behaving as at least specified. Okay. So, Joe, what what do, how are we do in terms of benchmarking? What's your approach? Uh, yeah. I think better to back to the question of Professor Li Chun Chun. <laughs> yeah. Okay. In terms of this, to the best of my knowledge, we haven't seen any uh, benchmark stuff. Um, you know about the uh, security. So, but the one thing, as uh, uh, Sandra just mentioned, is it's always a good idea actually to do, uh, to attract the attention in fact from the larger community to be aware of these kind of issues because security and defense is always asymmetric stuff. You know, the attackers always not something, but we defenders actually need to do much more. So, um, the the, the uh, as far as I know, uh, at least in the research community. So we have a thing, uh, two research tracks. That's what I just mentioned. One actually is from the AI research community. So uh, although most of the time they give their attention and effort to the uh, utility of the AI models, or you know how to build the foundation models and make it work, this kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, you know, a group of researchers actually really give attention to the uh, data centric analysis. So how to make the data. Uh, how to improve the quality of the data, in fact, to get the data assurance, to make sure that data has been properly cleaned so that the, the, the model could be, you know, uh, well trained and even the data during the test and time and the verification. Yes. So another effect is, uh, is about the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the verification of the syst uh, AI systems. So in this case, I think most of the researchers, in fact, don't really look at the algorithms directly. So they, they, they treat this AI as sort of the uh, functional blocks, in fact, and then adapt the software, uh, you know, uh, I mean, those model-based methodologies for software testing and verification, that what we, call, what we call the STV and VIP, right? Simulation testing, verification, and validation. So this kind of a tools, test beds, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, combination of those methods and the tools to verify the AI systems. So um, uh, another quite important thing, uh, in fact, for the uh, industry, in fact, is, is uh, to certify those AI functions, not individually, not independently, because nowadays, actually, as Peter has already mentioned, right? So the, the, the complexity of the network uh, of the, uh, the devices, and uh, uh, most of the time, actually, we have the service, the chain of the services, you know, provided by different service providers. Okay, you, I can take this service block, and then, you know, thanks to the open API, uh, APIs, I can invite, in fact, involve uh, the AI uh, functional blocks from an another service provider, right? How we can actually build such a, a trusted chain. So that's why, actually, back to the question I have just asked whether or not we can develop such a self-adaptive security architecture to accommodate all those concerns, you know, systematically in a holistic way. Okay. I, I know that is, is, is a, a very challenging topic, but uh, I think whether or not we can, you know, uh, 
in some you, you go life. back, sorry, but you go back to the argument, you can build it. I'm, I'm not no doubt about it. You can build it. But yeah, the but problem is you have to address the challenges. Yeah, no, but, the but the problem is where you can make the claims. You have built the system, you have built some protection systems. You can change on the fly. You can build that. It's not a problem, right? So the problem, the issue, you don't AI. I must admit you don't AI, right? Yeah. The problem now is to build the arguments. Right? So to have a, 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 a rationale which based on the evidence which being collected during runtime, the mm -hmm. operational, yeah. build the argument to, to, to build up a claim. Right? So that is the problem. You can build, there's no problem. Right? So if you're doing in academic terms, right, with my colleague in, 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 in current field, academic terms, you can build. Mm -hmm. The issue is where is going to deploy the thing. <laughs> right? Because afterwards they've got all the courts after our pay. Right, so and, and that is and that is the, the, the issue. And, and software cannot be legally responsible. No. Yeah. Uh, only right. people or companies. Yes. Yeah, that's the thing, yeah. You so, can see so Toyota, you can see Toyota. Toyota is the case. Yeah. Oh, do we have that? Go ahead, so, have. I have a question. Um, most of the explanation I've actually addressed uh, some of my question. But I still have uh, one or two power questions when I think maybe low level. But however, I think it is also uh, something that uh, I would need to be aware of. And secondly, I would also want to um, narrow the whole uh, scenario for let me to just be in particular, if you are going to apply or deploy this uh, uh, autonomous driven networks to, for instance, uh, a car automobile, right? And first of all, I like oh, the, the last presentation that he highlighted about the, 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 the danger of, or let me say, the application of uh, synthetic data. Actually, there are different factors that could fail if synthetic data should be applied. Because there are so many situations where are different in one different or let me say they are different from each other so if you train your system your uh, algorithm based on this particular uh, scenario and then you deploy this technology on this particular uh, uh, on automobile there are situations i would want to find out what exactly is is there instantaneous actions that will be taken because the with the car will have less uh, uh it will have less response or probably zero response when it has to do with something behind for instance you cannot compare how careful the driving uh, the driving system generally is in the uk for the past five decades or let me say two decades and then what could probably be the, uh, the driving uh, system in the next maybe two, three decades in future. Because we can also see that the youth of today, they have they are kind of reckless in, their way, in the way they drive. And this could actually uh, prove more risk scenarios. And I actually like the, uh, the, 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 the risk he highlighted because if there should be risk analysis at almost all levels. Now, let me give an example. If this particular autonomous driving car is, 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 is moving, because definitely it's going to be within, it has to attract with, uh, interact with all the cars within it. It's not specific, or it does not have specific. Well, focus on a particular uh, question, sir. Yes. Okay, I'm just going to, uh, sorry, to give some uh, little explanation before I can make this question. Okay, so what exactly is there anything in view that has been integrated for future your system, your algorithm? Have they actually put the future, the present, uh, sorry, looking at the present driving system and then what the driving system may look like in the future and what would be the response of this algorithm with things that has to do with not its own personal operation or performance, but when it has to do with external, let's say a car coming behind for some reasons, there is an absolute stop where another car has to come and hit this very particular car. 
that is yeah. that is a, so, uh, it's, it's a very simple word I've got in my presentation that's, yeah. that's uncertainty all right and uncertainty is an issue that the community I'm, my community is, is 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 battling all right so and this might be the one of the, the biggest challenges how to deal with what to deal with unknowns unknowns yes all right yes. so that is the issue all right because uh, and uh, and that's we're battling about this because you don't know uh, how the, uh, the uncertainty actually is propagated. Yes. If you've got if you've got several systems connected, all right, and there is a uncertainty at one level, how this propagated with a decision from one point to another point? Yeah, this is it, all right. And, and when you've got this uh, networks, even before, because the uncertainty will, will be propagated to a certain level that the system cannot deal with anymore. All right. So this is this is this is an uncertainty is the word that really the my community I think is is battling very hard. All right, trying to because you work even with the feedback control loop, you're trying to remove one of the reasons you need to handle the uncertainty feedback control loop. There is uncertainty. All right. There is inside the controller. There is uncertainty. Okay. So, so I don't use uncertainty so much, but I I recognise the same thing. I we talk about things that are outside your model. Yeah. Which is the same. Yeah. It seems to me in relation to that. But I guess to try and comment on what I think you were asking there, I think research has focused on, um, has concluded that we can't, you know, that we can't do things based on what the future might be because you get all of these uncertainties in it. So it has focused on how do you shorten, how do you shorten your action against the historical event? Yeah, so, so what we concluded when we were looking at accidents, yeah, was I could look at history. It's all in databases and things of this nature for electromechanical systems. I can get a lot of information out of that because it's based around physics and you know momentum of vehicles and things of that nature. Cyber security, digital systems changed that dynamic. Yeah. It basically meant I could not validly draw conclusions based on past events. But what we therefore meant was okay. I found an event. I need now to be able to act on that before it before that becomes something that affects me adversely too badly. That that is what we focused on. How do you shorten that? Yeah, we have we have in no way started to address the what do I do about this infinite space out front of stuff that I I have no idea what it's supposed to be doing. I suppose do you want to come in? Um, no, no, it's okay. I, I will. Okay. You have to hang up. <laughs> I'm just checking you hadn't put your hand up because you wanted to speak. Uh, okay, do, do we have anything? So I'm to one, one, one point that crossed my mind as we've been discussing things is this idea of trying to manage the failure. Because something you said, Peter, in your introduction is that you've got the risk of global failure in these types of networks, well, as opposed to just a local failure of cutting the car's brakes, et cetera. Do, do we anyone think it's possible to create a design scenario or an architecture which is compartmentalized and can manage the risk? Something like oh, we're looking for in the Morello network, that type of thing. Or is that not something we've considered? So just to manage the risk. So the failure wouldn't be a global failure. We didn't really manage the risk. I, I guess there's an interesting discussion there. Yes. Um, on, on the on the on whether we're talking about risk or harm or things of that nature. So, so I, I tend to concentrate on how much harm I can do, yeah, with the, these sorts of things. That risk is something that requires uh, risk is something that requires numbers. Usually, yeah, mo most of my risk techniques require I can create a probability, or, and generally I'm butted up against. I can't do I can't do one of the inputs to a fundamental risk calculation. So I tend to calculate how how much is the harm. So when I was doing autonomous pods. Uh, and looking at cyber attacks around them, it's like they can't go faster than 15 miles an hour. Yeah, we built them so that it goes down to the ground and it can only break my ankles anyway. Yeah, so so there's kind of a limit to how much harm it could do in relation to that. The worst I could do is drive out onto the street in front of the car, and that comes down to individual play. And you you could talk, you could look at those sorts of things. When we started looking at what might you want to do if you were wanting to make a general statement, what we started looking at was how do I control the harm? And the way that we set we set out to control the harm was by looking at how do I actually show that there's enough difference and then most particularly enough significant difference between things that they don't all, all fail in the same way at the same time. But how do I get back to something that is a lot closer? So 
if I don't trust my AI in dripping yet algorithm, how do I make it not so catastrophically disastrous if it goes wrong? Yeah, and those that's where we that's where we started putting a lot of work in to try and try and control the the yeah yeah those aspects of it because that we felt was going to be really important and we felt that society so you think that's the fundamental design methodology yeah, I, I, seems I, I, to be something yeah, managing yeah the like harm. you said I have no mechanism to give you zero failures yeah okay. yeah. Um, just sort of to extend it, I think that there's sort of a, a trade-off or a um, disparity between the, the frameworks that we talked about at the beginning, the FC and the ITUT, that the yeah. complexity of those do sort of, because they're so complex, they sort of feed into the idea of a single entity having oversight and being able to produce all of that and produce, manage the interconnections and design the APIs, etc., um, which doesn't really work from this perspective of what we would always put into when you talk about safety systems redundancy, you'll always have multiple solutions, you talk about, about multiple hardware platforms, multiple software, OI, operating systems, et cetera, to allow you that uh, fallback uh, and variability. So there's kind of two, you know, a bit of a disparity between how this how it's designed to look um, to address that global, um, for, for a global approach to it. If you pick up one of the questions, is mentioning self-healing, self-protection. And that, they can be conflicting, all right? Because if it's really not working, all right? So you might might check a redundancy, redundant component, or do us an alternative service. But how, how, what's the security then? What's the protection of it, all right? So you might go for, there is some conflicting. So you, what you need to understand, and that your question is quite relevant. What you need to understand is this, there are several control loops going on. All right, and you go back to Charles Sparrow, all right, no more accidents. And the basis of, of, of uh, is, you know, is what I'm talking about, all right, of, of, of nuclear power stations, which they, this, is in, this is implicit, a lot of feedbacks go to look, can it affect each other? Mm -hmm. And they've got this emergent behaviors, which we lose control. And the notions of self healing, self protection, self uh, optimization, self uh, configuration, all of these require different goals. All of these require different techniques. All of these require different models, all right? And this might lead to a conflict, right? We are aware of that. It might lead to a conflict. And uh, it's very beautiful, the all the self style I think it's very beautiful, but when you put together uh, with, with uh, considering security, this is, 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 you know, because you go back to Charles Perrow, essentially, all right? You go back to Charles Perrow, it is, it's very easy for human lose a notion what is operational state of the system that the human just Responsible, mm -hmm. right? And this is dangerous. This is a very dangerous issue that we are aware of, right? And uh, but the, or again, the evidence, the claims, or the, the arguments and the claims are extremely difficult to extract from this, right? depending on the on the level of risk of the system. Mm -hmm. I didn't quite understand your notion about impact, and um, and um, you focus on impact, but you can have this discussion offline. Right. Okay. Well, this is go back. This is go back. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe listen. I think yeah, I'll be quick. Um, it was a point I wanted to make earlier, which um, I think is appropriate at this point, is that I think we, we must not think only about physical trust performance metrics. So if you imagine that you are someone learning to drive and your instructor is only looking at your performance based on how well you drive, I think that's only one part of that person's trust. I think another part is your ability to verbally or semantically explain the context of your decisions. I think the reasoning is more often more important as a, a foundation for human trust rather than just the end result of the performance, right? You could get good performance for the wrong reasons, right? And there's no pathway to improvement if you don't explain causally what's actually affecting you. But I think another point is also trust that naturally builds up over time. So if you do longitudinal autonomous vehicle studies, you'll see that people tend to trust over very long periods. And I'm talking about weeks and months, right? Not, not hours. So, so, so trust naturally improves over time. And one factor we must not forget is that simply, um, you know, autonomous or AI systems are relatively new to humanity compared to how long human beings have interfaced with each other, right? And the kind of informal and formal systems we've built up and accepted. And I, I think some of this will just be a factor of time, but I think we can try to accelerate that by understanding how human beings trust each other and uh, other things, 
um, in informal ways and try to loop the human stakeholder into that trust program rather than try to have a universal metrics and interfaces that, that seem to address this on a general basis. Okay, that, that's my point. Okay, thanks, Rosie. Okay, we're fairly near the end of the session. Maybe we'll just wrap up if we could go around and ask people the fundamental question of, do we think an effective security architecture for networks can be created? Maybe Peter can go first. It's a little bit subjective. What do you mean by effective? <laughs> yeah, so long as you don't define any of the words, I'm, I'm good on that one. I, I guess, actually, the example I'd, I'd like to do. Well, are you optimistic or pessimistic, I guess? It's, uh... I'm pessimistic <laughs> that we will do what we need to do. I believe that we are, we have recently figured out that almost all human deaths are down to autoimmune responses of your body namely your body reacting in an inappropriate way so so wherever i look at this stuff i look at the fact that what you're actually looking at is a situation where we don't know how to control these things and often we don't even recognize the outcomes that we're getting from that i think in the digital world we need to do better than that and we need to actually at least acknowledge that and accept it not just put it into place and hope that nobody notices yeah, I, I would lean uh, towards the, um, the, the pessimistic or the challenging end of it. I think the one thing to take away, um, perhaps from this conversation and from, from several others I've had, is the, the definitions um, to achieve anything. Uh, I think we need to understand each other quite well. Um, and we all have slightly varying definitions of all of the terms that we've mm -hmm. been talking about. Um, we see that not, that's just within this community. You can imagine when we bring together multiple disciplines the challenge of that so we, and those people will need to be in one of these conversations um so i think that the death defining and, and understanding our, our common language is really important to achieve i think so i'm an optimist i've got to be optimists i think you've got plenty uh because we if you're stuck with a pessimist i think you still need to be in the caves actually right uh be paid to pay people essentially so um, I'm an optimist because technology is pushing the boundaries very fast and very, 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 very fast. And, and sometimes the, the, the issue is dealing with the complexity, all right? That's the issue. And I'm sorry, but humans won't be able to deal with complexity, all right? So the humans have to be, I'm still, all I've got a PhD student tell me otherwise, all right? I still think that humans are supposed to be out of the world completely because they might do more damage than, uh, than, than, than good, all right? So this is, this is from what I've learned from safety critical systems from a long time ago. And from observing the complexity of the system I'm dealing with, the multiple feedback on the loops, et cetera, is, uh, I need to be positive, all right? But um, humans out, all right? Okay, we'll be pricey. Um, I, I think it's definitely a race between autonomy, performance within autonomy, and the security and trust aspects of it. I think definitely, you know, security and trust is behind in that race, but I think people are turning around the corner in terms of research and realizing that this is a new gap, um, and that, you know, with sufficient intellectual power and critical mass of people around the world working on it, I'm confident human innovation, so I'm very very optimistic that we'll catch up to this but you know we just have to give it its time and process and it will naturally do that okay. yeah it's my turn yes uh, i think i'm also quite uh, optimist about this but they, they have to recognize that the situation is hot right um but um, uh, in terms of the definitions sorry <laughs> i didn't like to clarify this yes for self-adaptive security. So in my humble opinion is that uh, uh, we actually need to, to, to work toward that. So uh, Roger has mentioned that it's already there, but uh, we need to verify. Trust but the verify. So um, in my mind, I mean, from my experience is that it's basically for, uh, as uh, uh, Darius had just put the question regarding a risk assessment, Right. Uh, there are some standards uh, framework actually to define and to you know measure to evaluate the risks. So uh, I think uh, you know with knowing these kind of risks, how can we manage them right? by deploying and managing those basic security functions mm. uh, and the security policies actually. 
then the bottom level could be the self-awareness stock, right? Uh, like uh, Roger has given some figures about the self-awareness. Okay? So this could be somehow controlled uh, by very basic rules. I mean, with basic, uh, with very basic predefined rules. So uh, we can, uh, you know, form uh, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, closed loop from monitoring to analysis to reaction, right? So without human intervention. But the thing is about the complexity, as you just mentioned. Then, uh, you know, especially with the process, because Peter also has mentioned about the human body, the immune system. So uh, in fact, the researchers have already proposed, you know, lots of these kind of security models to manage those different security functions. The MAPK models, you know, uh, feedback control models, you know, uh, separate immunity, right, which have been proposed, I think, in the 1990s. So the, then all those models actually, when they too have the policies predefined. So from the point of view of the security administrator, so we know we have those assets, okay, and we need to protect them. Then we specify the policies. But think that always the zero day attacks and vulnerabilities come up due to the integration of the new devices for IoT, for example, right? With automobile, the same story. Then the, the policies actually, how can they adapt themselves to the new environments? Maybe uh, Sandra has just mentioned about the the, the, the a digital twin, right? How to get this kind of policies or defensive strategies in other ones so that they can, you know, really take this those policies in the face of uh, new attacks. So uh, um, I'm not really sure whether we can agree on some points that this could be the, the, the future somehow directions that we need to work on. Okay, well, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, it's come down to a lunchtime. So it's all remains for me is to thank the panelists very much for their time this morning and everybody else for uh, attending the session. I think, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.